I want to tell you a little bit about St. Francis, and then I want to tell you a little bit about the program of which this forum tonight is a part. Uh, St. Francis is now at its largest in its history, 2,700 students. And that hasn't changed its fundamental feature, its warmth and friendliness. It's ranked every year as a top regional college by U.S. News and World Report, and it's ranked every year as one of America's best colleges on the Forbes listing. St. Francis just began two new master's degrees in accounting. Let me tell you a little bit about the program. We've had a whole series of forums on a variety of subjects here. On the New York State budget, forum on the New York Times, is it good for democracy, question mark, which was carried on C-SPAN. The youth vote in the coming 2012 election. Now, coming up on March 28th, and you'll all get invitations to this by email, we'll have a discussion of the West and its rival civilizations. Uh, and the speaker will be Eben Warwick, who some of you might know, um, one of the outstanding Quranic scholars in the United States. And next fall, we'll have programs on life in New York after Bloomberg, seemingly endless, and on the meaning of the 2012 elections. But now let me introduce you to the moderator for tonight's program, Saint, the academic dean of St. Francis, Provost, excuse me, academic vice president, provost, St. Francis's resident labor historian, Dean Timothy Houlihan. Yeah, we're definitely going to hurt each other going up and down those stairs, but we'll do your best. Thank you, Fred. You're welcome. As Fred said, I'm Tim Houlihan. I'm the provost here at St. Francis. On behalf of President Dugan and the Board of Trustees, I welcome you. Um, I'd also like in particular uh, to welcome and to thank the members of the St. Francis College Education Society, as well as the students from the Department of Education here at St. Francis, and their faculty members who so gently and lovingly encouraged their attendance at this event. I do appreciate it. Really. Uh, thank you, Fred our scholar in residence for organizing this event along with all the other intriguing and exciting events you've uh, done for us over the past couple of years. I'd also like to thank our partners in sponsoring this event, Albany Law School and the Manhattan Institute. So <clears throat> I'm going to do my best. National Review Online. Is, is, is and the National Review Online. Will they send me a check? <laughs> Online. <laughs> oh, I know about those. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to do my best to act as moderator, and as you can see, it's not going to be easy. But um, if you look in your programs, you'll see an outline uh, for the event. Um, I will first introduce each speaker in turn. A. Blackman will speak for approximately 20 minutes, laying out the current landscape of high school enrollments, the trends we must all now confront. And following Abe, Saul Stern speak for 10 to 15 minutes, looking more in depth at some of the statistics we read every day in the Times, the News, and the Post. After Saul, Mr. James Coltrara, and then Joe Williams will each have about 10 minutes to respond to what they've heard. Um, and we'll then have approximately 20 minutes for questions and answers, which is more than sufficient time to solve this minor issue. After that, I'll send you all home to mull over what you've heard. So, for our panel, I'm going to keep you to your allotted time. I know you all have much to say, and much more to say than you can possibly fit in, but believe me, the time limit is designed to ensure just that. For our audience, I ask that you please hold your questions until the question and answer period, and that you wait for me to call on you. Uh, if you don't hold your questions, I won't call on you, and no one will answer them. This is what we call classroom management in Catholic colleges. You lay out clear expectations, you know, you just stick to them. So first, it is my pleasure to introduce Abraham Lackman, the Clarence D. Rappelier Government Scholar in Residence at Albany Law School's Government Law Center, which, again, is one of our co-sponsors this evening. You can see many particulars of his biography in your programs, but just for emphasis, 
I would like to note that Mr. Lachman was most recently the president of the Commission on Independent Colleges and Universities at KIKU, as we call it. He brilliantly coordinated the state and federal public policy advocacy efforts, try to say that, really, uh, of more than 100 college presidents from New York State's private, nonprofit, independent institutions of higher education, including St. Francis. Abe recently presented his findings on trends in high school enrollments to a group of Catholic higher education leaders here at St. Francis, and his rational, thoughtful, and insightful presentation makes me eager to hear him speak tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Abe Lachman. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking about what's been going on with Catholic school enrollment over the last two decades, and particularly focusing in on the impact of charter schools. Um, charter schools are a relatively new phenomena in the country. Um, by in 1990, I don't think there was a single charter school. Um, Charter schools were authorized in New York State in 1998, um, and they started to, started to open up probably in late 1999 and 2000. And at the time that the charter school debate in New York was taking place, I was the head of the Senate Finance Committee in Albany, running the staff, and I remember that debate very well. Charter schools are an alternative to public municipal schools. And they were seen as having two purposes. One, to trigger innovation um, in the public school system. And two, um, to really address the issue of underperforming schools in large urban areas, New York City, Buffalo, Albany, Syracuse, in Rochester. And the state legislature and the governor in late 98 authorized 200 charter schools. And today in New York State, we have roughly 180 of these schools not run by the school system. These schools, though, are public schools. And each one of these schools receives a subsidy from government or the taxpayer of probably between Ten and eighteen thousand dollars per student in New York City. I think the average um, is around fourteen thousand dollars per student. And during that whole debate in two thousand in nineteen ninety eight, since I was at the table during the enactment of the charter school legislation, the issue of its impact on the parochial or Catholic school system never came up. Nobody talked about it. Um, it wasn't even on the radar screen. Like I said, last year, um, particularly because of $700 million in what's known as the race to the top competition, the state legislature and the governor increased the number of authorized charter schools in New York State from 200, we now have about 180, to a maximum of 460 charter schools. Just to give you a sense of that magnitude of 460 charter schools. We have about 4,000 public schools in New York State. It bounces around, but it's over 4,000. We have today, currently, 600 Catholic schools in New York State. So, so the question arises, what has been the impact of charter schools, both on the public's enrollment and particularly on Catholic school enrollment, recognizing that when that debate, both for the first 200 and the second 260, Nobody even talked about its impact on Catholic schools. Being a numbers person in preparing for this presentation, I have put together a number of slides that looks at the demographics of what's been going on, both in Catholic school enrollment, public school enrollment, and charter school enrollment. And you just have to bear with me as I try to master the slides. Kind of give away. This is a little bit faster than I'm used to. 
even I'm going to have to take a test. I kind of give away one of the key takeaways. Between 1990 and 2000, between 1990 and 2000, Catholic, Catholic school enrollment in the United States and in New York actually, in the nation, it actually rose slightly. In New York, it was basically flat. It declined, it declined um, almost zero growth. So between 2000 and 2010, Catholic school enrollment, K through 12, declined by 23%. In New York State, that decline is 35%. If you look at what's going on in K through eight, in Catholic school enrollment, the decline is 43%. If you go down a step to what has been the, the impact on K through six enrollment in Catholic schools, it's 46%, over 46%. So in the last decade, going again, if you go between 1990 and 2000, no decline whatsoever. In many parts of the country, actually a slight increase. If you look between 2000 and 2010, particularly in New York, I'm now starting to look at other states, it's been a collapse in Catholic school enrollment. I'm going to dissect where that decline happened, but a significant factor in that decline has been the rise of charter schools. I give here some numbers. It shows that in 1990, public school enrollment in the nation went from 41 million to 2010, where it's at 49 million. So you've seen about a 20% increase in public school enrollment. Um, Catholic school enrollment went from 2.4 to 1.9 million. A fairly significant decline, but the key again is if you look between 1990 and 2000, Catholic school enrollment actually increased. And then you see in 1990, there was no enrollment in charter schools. It has been an, it's been an extraordinary new phenomena in education. And today, we are probably around 2 million students nationally. In New York, you're seeing somewhat similar numbers, although the growth in publics in New York has not been as strong. In 1990, you had 2.5 million students in public schools. Today, you're around 2.6 million, up 100,000. Catholic school enrollment is down 100,000. And charter schools, which started basically in 2000, are now over 50,000 students. So now let's take a look at what happened. The first cause for the decline in Catholic school enrollment is simply demographics. In the last decade, what, what you see here is between 1980 and, two, and 19, between 1980 and 1995, actual kindergarten enrollment increased by 31%. The big increase in the publics, the very modest increase in Catholics, was driven by that bait, what's referred to as a baby boomlet. So between 1980 and 1995, you see a, a roughly a 31% increase. After 95, that increase started to decline. Between 95 and 2002, you've seen a decline in kindergarten enrollment of about 14% in New York. That trend is almost replicated throughout the Northeast. Nationally, nationally, you actually see a similar pattern between 1980 and 95. National kindergarten enrollment went up 31 percent. Between 95 and 2002, it declined 4 percent, not the 14 percent that you saw in the Northeast. And after 19,002, Unlike New York and the Northeast, kindergarten enrollment has started to rise fairly strongly. One of the questions when I show this chart, particularly for New York, is how did that happen between upstate Long Island and New York City, that decline in kindergarten enrollment? Between 95 and 2005, <coughs> decline in kindergarten enrollment was almost identical, which was a little bit of a surprise, between upstate New York, New York City, and Long Island. After 95, New York City started to grow fairly rapidly. So between 95, 2005 and 2010, kindergarten enrollment started to rise in New York City 
but it is continuing to decline in upstate and Long Island. So, as you will see later on, when you take into account the decline in kindergarten enrollment in New York State, that accounts for about 24, 25 percent of the overall decline in Catholic school enrollment between 2000 and 2010. So the mystery to try to decipher is you still have a 75 percent of the drop in Catholic school enrollment. How much of it is due to public schools and how much of it is due to charter schools? Now we get to the impact on charter schools. And this is probably, in terms of my numbers, a critical assumption. What I looked is I had a, I had a lot of support from the Catholic Conference, and I want to acknowledge Katie Van Auken, who's a law third year law student at Albany Law School, who helped me with the analysis. What we were able to do is to break the decline in Catholic school enrollment between K through 8 and 9 through 12. Why is that important? Because charter schools, again, fairly new phenomena. They've only been around for 10 years. And for the last 10 years, they have almost no Catholic high schools, no charter high schools. So charter schools are primarily a K through 6 or a K through 8 phenomena. So the Catholic high schools have not been competing with the charter schools where the elementary Catholic schools are. And if you look, the drop in enrollment at Catholic high schools in the last decade was about 12 percent, which is somewhat consistent with the decline in demographics. But as you see, the decline in K through 8 is four times as deep as the decline in 9 through 12. So I'm using this is the 9 through 12 as the proxy to measure the impact of charter schools on the K through 8. And when you make that adjustment, you now get to the bottom line, is that between, and I want to go back one chart, as you see in 2000, we had 202,000 students in K through 8 Catholic schools. Today we've are down to 115,000. So we have a decline of 87,000 students. That is the key number I am trying to dissect. I, my analysis shows that demographics or the drop in ki kindergarten enrollment accounts for 24.4% of the overall decline in Catholic school enrollment in K through eight. When I make that adjustment between what is going on with the high school enrollment versus the K through eight, I say that there has been about 33,000 students who have left the Catholic system and have migrated to the publics, in many cases because of the cost pressure. I then come down to the, the and that's 38.8, 38.3%. I then come down to 32,000 stu lost students that I attribute to the rise of the charter school movement. So my observation, in the last decade, Catholic school enrollment has collapsed. If you lose 46% of your clients or your customers, to me, you're on the verge of collapse. From my perspective, this decline is broken into three parts. 24% reduction in overall enrollment, 38% going to public schools, and 37% going to charter schools. What's interesting is the 38% that is going to public schools, there are 4,000 public schools going after those students. The charter schools is starting from a base of 180 students. I think the outlook, unless there's a law change, is bleak. Um, and the main reason that I am pessimistic is in the next decade, you're going to go from 180 charter schools in New York to 200, 460, an increase of 280. And I'm saying that a major source of the students they are capturing, given the types of schools they are, are coming out of the Catholic school system. Uh, my estimate 
is if there is not a law change, we lost 30,000 students to the charters, the Catholic school system, you're going to lose another 50,000 on top of that in the next decade. I don't think this system can sustain that. That is the end of my presentation. I have no good news. Saul Stern, again, as you can see in your program, is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, our other sponsoring partner this evening, and a contributing editor of City Journal, along with extensive writing on the Middle East and Israel. Mr. Stern has turned his attention to the issues of school choice, recent education reform efforts, E.D. Hirsch and core knowledge. The students are supposed to know who that is. And social justice teaching at the education schools. It is my pleasure to introduce Saul Stern. Uh, well, Fred, Fred uh, f can you hear me? Uh, Fred said San Francis is such a nice, warm place. And after that, the grim news from from Abe, I thought I just spread the, the warmth a little by uh, uh, telling you of about a blessed event. My friend Fred Siegel is now a grandfather. So I think everyone ought to give him a hand. That's, that, that, that's, that's a sign of hope in, the, in this... Uh, in this uh, grim report by Abe. Uh, but I do want to congratulate Abe for laying the facts out, and particularly because um, I know how difficult it is uh, for my own work to, um, to get this information, to get the data. I mean, I love the Catholic schools, but they're not the most efficient pl uh, uh, organizations in the world, at least you know, at the central level. So I've always had a problem getting it, it's just, marvelous that you have this all out there and so that we can now discuss uh, uh, you know the broader implications of all this and um, th that's what what I want to do uh, and I'll try to you know keep I'm, I'm going to just take about 10 minutes is give you a, a bit of a flavor of the, there's a there's a broader political and cultural background developments over these last 10 years that matches what Abe has seen in the data. And um, uh, I don't think it's just a question uh, of Catholic schools versus charter schools. I think we ought to think of the, um, all these different school sectors, Catholics, charters, private, public, as really part of a, uh, a dynamic ecosystem in which uh, developments in any one sector also affect what happens in the other sectors. I mean, that's, that's so clear in terms of finances, teacher salaries, which I'll talk a little bit about, go up in the public schools. The impact on, and on Catholic schools is just enormous, and I've seen this over the years. So I, I uh, without being too uh, immodest, I, I think I'm well-placed to uh, give you some of this background, because I started covering uh, the public schools and the Catholic schools and charters uh, 16 years ago. Uh, my first article in City Journal uh, on, on education was called The uh, Hidden Miracle of Catholic Schools, and it, it got a lot of attention, uh, particularly because it was picked up by the Wall Street Journal that published long ep excerpts on the op-ed page. My advice to writers, if you can get a piece in the Wall Street Journal, uh, you'll never be anonymous again. Uh, anyway, it, uh, it, one thing that, that it did is it, it got me an invitation from Cardinal O'Connor to have breakfast with him in his official residence. So he could thank me for what he said uh, uh, was about a million dollars worth of free publicity for his, his embattled schools. Now, at the time, I know uh, Abe, Abe, Abe's numbers in general are that Catholic schools were kind of flat during that period. But you have to distinguish between, let's say, suburban Catholic schools and what was happening in the inner city Catholic schools. And in New York City in the 90s, you began to see this uh, erosion. Uh, uh, the schools that started to close. Um, and uh, Cardinal O'Connor recognized the crisis and deeply concerned. But he was a fighter, and he was in a fighting mood. And um, um, he had even issued a challenge uh, in, in the Archdiocese newspaper to the public schools 
because someone had, I think it was Al Shanker or someone associated with the public schools, had sort of made a comment, uh, in, in effect saying, well, you know, all this supposed success of the Catholic schools, which has been well documented as compared to the public schools, is partly a factor of the fact that, you know, the Catholic schools don't have the worst students. You know, they don't have all the problems that we have, all these problem students. So Cardinal O'Connor wrote an article and he said, Really? Is that so? I challenge you. Send us your, the 5% of the worst public students in the public school system. And he said, believe me, we'll take them and uh, we'll do very good with them. And I think that was true. Nobody took him up on it. Um, anyway, uh, O'Connor also, Cardinal O'Connor also told me how proud he was that in central Harlem, where at that time there wasn't a single, I mean central, the central Harlem district, a single public high school. There was Rice High School, 100 years in the, in the community. When the Catholic, when the Irish and the Italians left, stayed with, uh, it, it stayed there and began to educate black and Hispanic kids. And as he said, and so I've heard this so many times, so we, we don't do it because, and most of them were not, were not Catholics. We don't do it because uh, they're Catholic. We do it because we're Catholics. Um, and one of the reasons that uh, the Cardinal could fight back at that time, there was quite a lot of fight left in, in, in the system, was that he, uh, he, um, uh, the mayor of the city of New York had his back. Uh, we don't, it's important to remember that uh, Mayor Giuliani was an outspoken supporter of Catholic schools. As a product of Catholic schools, he himself had been, uh, he had a keen understanding of the contribution to the city made by those schools and their ability to educate the toughest kids. Uh, Mayor Giuliani even tried to get the Board of Ed to agree to some form of vouchers allowing kids to transfer to Catholic schools, for which, of course, he was slammed by the Board and, and the New York Times. Uh, but he seized on some of the publicity coming out of my article and uh, working with a number of uh, philanthropists, uh, instituted what was essentially a private voucher program for public school kids to transfer to Catholic schools. And it was pretty amazing, because in, in, in the scholarships were announced in, and very late in the year, and within four months, they had a lottery. 20,000 kids applied, uh, the, uh, the philanthropists came up with $20 million. Over 20,000 kids applied for the scholarships. And uh, at the lottery, they picked the 900 lucky kids who were able to leave their failing public schools. It was very much like some of the charter schools now have these lotteries. The purpose of which, obviously, <laughs> is to uh, draw a little dramatic impact and to show how desperately these kids need these alternatives. Uh, the charter school, and, and it had some of that effect, and, and uh, that's one of the great things about that uh, private, uh, the uh, private scholarship. In any event, it's, it's hard to know what effect uh, Mayor Giuliani's courageous advocacy for the Catholic schools would have had on the demographics if he had been able to stay in office be beyond 2001, which is the great year for you. But as, as you all know, we have a constitutional democracy here in Gotham. And the, and the Constitution said two terms for the mayor was enough. So Rudy had to go. But of course, and his, his successor was a very rich man who did manage to get that third term by basically buying off almost everyone who had a say in the matter. But never mind about that. Let's go to that successor and his dramatic education reform. And they are. This, uh, I was a big supporter of them originally. Mayor Bloomberg essentially made the following bargain with, with New Yorkers, with the public. He said, New York City had a totally dysfunctional school system. Nobody was in charge, and there was no one the public could hold accountable. All of which was absolutely true. I mean, it was a, it was a horror show right down here, a few doors, a few doors down. Uh, something out of Kafka. So, the mayor... So explain, explain what you just referred to. A few doors down. People don't know? The old Board of Education headquarters? The old Board of Education was on 110 <laughs> Livingston Street. 
There's some young people here, so. Oh, I see. Anyway, he 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 offered a deal to to the citizens of New York, to the public, and he said, um, "Give me control of the schools." Essentially, he said it to the legislature, and I promise you, you're going to get a bigger buck for your education, a uh, bigger bang for your education buck. We're going to have real accountability, and. Uh, and that accountability is, if, uh, if uh, I fail to deliver on the promise, you can vote me out at the next election. Sounds very reasonable, right? The question always was, so what happens if he's elected, even though people don't like what he's doing on education? Well, he answered that question. He said, well, then you can boo me at parades. Anyway, the mayor's reform agenda, when he presented it uh, in 2003 on, on Martin Luther King Day, it sounded very impressive. He said City Hall would find the best curriculums, cut out waste, hold teachers and administrators accountable, and raise academic achievement. The school's budget then was around $12 billion, and the mayor explicitly said, basically that ought to be enough, there ought to be, you know, some, some rise in inflation. It be, ought to be enough to run a good system if it was used efficiently. In fact, in less than 10 years, the budget almost doubled to the present figure of $23.7 billion. And I have no hesitation in saying that this was likely the biggest increase in education spending by any school district in the history of American education. So what was accomplished with that huge increase in spending? You know, it's... In my view, I think it's the view that's now the prevalent view, not very much. Little significant academic improvement or any narrowing of the racial achievement gap. But the impact of all those extra billions in the public sector was very, very serious for the Catholic schools. For one thing, a huge chunk went to higher and higher teacher salaries, a 43% across the board increase. That put tremendous financial pressure on the Catholic schools to raise their own teachers' salaries. They were always behind, but it had to keep up to some extent. To give you some sense of how severe that was, when I started writing about the uh, Catholic schools, the gap between the top teacher salary in the public schools compared to the Catholic schools was about $25,000. Today, it's close to $50,000. Catholic school teachers, most of them, are very, very dedicated, but there are limits, and we've reached those limits about being able to attract high-quality teachers uh, when the competition can pay so much more. But it wasn't just the higher, the higher direct public school expenditures. To add insult to injury, the mayor brought in at least another $200 million in contributions to the public schools from his friends in the philanthropic community, all of it tax deductible. Some of that money was spent by the Fund for Public Schools on a million dollar advertising campaign touting the progress of the public schools, which just by coincidence occurred in the middle of the 2005 mayoral campaign. That money from the philanthropic community also had an effect on the shift to charter schools that Abe has shown in this presentation. It wasn't just that charter schools now became the first choice of most philanthropic giving, or a large part of it, but that some of the money went directly into what was tantamount, in my view, to the poaching of Catholic school students. That happened, that's happened most dramatically in Harlem, where charters have been flourishing, and there are some very good charters in Harlem. And Catholic schools have been dying at a very rapid rate. The Harlem Success Academies use donations from philanthropists to mount a sophisticated million-dollar marketing campaign to the community. Ads on buses touted what a good deal Harlem success was for parents. Obviously a better deal than Catholic schools because it was all free. Community people were hired to go door-to-door -to -door selling the charter schools to parents. Now, you might say that philanthropic money going to education is a good thing. It doesn't really matter where it goes. That's true up to a point. But the terrible fact is that for the Catholic schools, 
Sustenance from philanthropy is a question of hunger. Whereas for the public schools and the charters, with $23 billion available in taxpayer funds, it's a question of appetite. In New York over these past 10 years, appetite trumped hunger. In all his years in City Hall, Mike Bloomberg has never spoken a word about the crisis of the Catholic school. He has never summoned his wealthy philanthropist friends to step in. He has never given a speech on the consequences for the city, for our most stressed communities, if the Catholic schools disappeared. It seems to me that just as a matter of smart public policy, if not morality, that is extremely short-sighted. Because as these schools close, the kids inevitably will be coming into the public schools where the city is now spending over $20,000 per pupil for an inferior product. It just doesn't make sense. And perhaps the best way to understand what's at stake is to look at the fate of Rice High School, the school that Cardinal O'Connor told me he was so proud of. I got to know Rice over the years. I wrote about it in City Journal. And I don't think I was ever so impressed in any school that I've ever been to at the dedication and the way in which the school was run, the philosophy behind the school. I can sum it up by the fact that when you entered Rice, which was on a year 125th Street, in an old wine, decrepit Weinstein A building, that was 100 years old, and just above the entrance to the school, there was a placard, a sign. And the sign said, the street stops here. And these boys, young men from some of the toughest neighborhoods in the city, would come in. I was there in the morning as they came in. And they'd be, particularly in the winter, they, you know, their, their long down jackets and their hoodies. And they'd walk under that sign, and that's exactly what happened. The street stopped. They came off the street, they took off their jackets, and there they were, their green rice blazers with their shirts and ties and they were rice gentlemen, that's what they were called. And the success of that school in turning out in the most difficult of circumstances, kids really graduated, 80, 90% really graduated. And they didn't graduate because of the favorite technique of this DOE, credit recovery, which means a way, a gimmick to sort of boost the graduation rate. They graduated and went either to at decent colleges, or went into the army, or went into professions. Uh, and so um, that's what we, Rice, Rice went under last year. And it went under for want, it was a, a jewel of the city, and it had expired for want of $400,000. So schools like Rice can't be replaced, and it's an enormous tragedy for the city. And I ask, is it not possible for those with the power to do something, to see what is happening, and to actually do something? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stern. Uh, now for responses, we turn to two gentlemen whose careers and writing mark them as great advocates for the children of the state of New York. Uh, first up, Mr. James Coltrara is Director of Education for the New York State Catholic Conference, representing the Roman Catholic bishops of New York State in their advocacy for the state's Catholic school system. Uh, the system currently includes 600 schools, as we were told earlier, 200,000 students approximately and 17,000 teachers. In addition, he is also co-chairman of the New York State Coalition for Independent and Religious Schools, coordinating the public policy advocacy of nearly 2,000 independent and religious schools across the state. Mr. Coltrara is the recipient of the Leonard F. DeFiori Parental Choice Advocate Award, which is presented to an individual who has demonstrated outstanding leadership in promoting full and fair parental choice in education. In presenting the award, the National Catholic Education Association noted he is a passionate advocate for the rights of parents to choose the best education for their children. Please welcome Mr. Coltrara.
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I wasted my time uh, over the last few days um, writing down some comments that I thought I should make, uh, realizing you don't really prepare to respond to something until you hear it. So I've got a number of scattered notes now that I'm going to try to decipher. But um, I've been inspired by what Abe and Saul have had to say. I've also been alarmed, particularly by what you've had to say, Abe. Um, and as an advocate, I hope parents are alarmed. I hope taxpayers are alarmed. I hope lawmakers are alarmed. Um, <clears throat> we already have an unlevel playing field in this country and in the state in terms of education, in terms of elementary and secondary education. Um, as, as Saul said, we're spending $23 billion, that's the state is spending $23 billion on public education. In, to city. in, the, in the city. Um, city. New York State in total, local taxpayers and the state are spending close to $55 billion on all of public education. There's an enormous investment of taxpayer dollars in the government-run system. Where's the support for the independent and religious schools? One thing I want to add, this is, although the numbers are particularly alarming for Catholic schools, this is not just an, a problem for Catholic schools. These issues affect all independent and religious schools. So we should keep that in mind. But where's the support for the independent and religious school system? It comes from the sacrifice of parents who are already paying some of those taxes to support the public sector. They're paying anywhere from three to five billion dollars extra in tuition to support those their children in those independent religious schools. So they're paying three billion dollars out of their pockets to keep our schools alive to say to to serve their children. That's where the support comes from. So fifty five billion versus three billion of the state aid that we receive and government aid that we receive from the federal government um, for instructional materials, special education services, health care services, transportation services, amounts to less than 1% of what is spent in the, in the government school sector. So we already have an enormous, un, uh, enormously unbalanced um, playing field. And with the creation of charter schools, um, it has even created a more unbalanced playing field. Um, <clears throat> so the picture you've painted is very bleak. Um, one reaction I, I didn't anticipate having, Abe, is um, you, you characterize the system as on the verge of collapse. Right? You lose that portion of your, such a significant portion of your customers. How can you sustain yourself? One thing that that fails to take into consideration is that we're not a retail chain of stores, wherein a retail chain of stores would go under, right? Uh, independent religious schools, and for the most part, those who are run by faith-based uh, communities, are mission-driven. They're ministry and mission-driven. The mission and ministry will remain, even if the means has to change. You've obviously characterized and, and, and helped to um, shed some light on that fact that it's changing and that it will continue to change. But the mission and ministry will always be there. The Catholic superintendents have discussed what, what, is, what will Catholic schools look like in the coming years? Question. They know it will be there, but what will it be like? It'll have to, if, if these trends continue, it'll be so significantly different. They'll have to restructure in such a way just to keep a system alive. They'll be very different from what they are now. So whether lawmakers realize it or not, and I think they do realize it, um, <clears throat> what they've done is exacerbated the unlevel playing field. And by subsidizing charter schools and continuing to subsidize our regular public schools, by subsidizing only the government run sector of the schools, they have in fact forced tuition to rise. Because 
as they sub provide subsidy to charter schools, I'm going to call it a subsidy, it's tuition, right? But it's a subsidy. Um, and parents take advantage of that. Parents who are seeking, our, who are in our schools, seeking an alternative to the public school, um, they're going to take advantage of it. We can't blame them. They're going to take advantage of an alternative where they can save on that tuition and, and save for college or save for whatever expenses. Um, when they leave, there's fewer families in the Catholic school, independent religious school, to support the cost of that school. So there's a compounding effect. Abe, you've put these uh, statistics in three large buckets, right? Demo demographic realities, um, the regular cost realities that, have, that drive people from the private sector into the public sector, and then the influence of charter schools. I think the problem actually may be, it may be worse than what you've characterized. I hate to say that, it's worse enough, right? It may be worse because when a family leaves to go to a charter school or go to a public school for whatever reason, it increases the pressure on the families that remain. Then because that pressure increases, more have to leave because those other ones left. That's right. right? And, and so there's that compounding influence that um, I don't know that we could ever try to uh, ever uh, uh, put numbers on. Um, but lawmakers, whether they realize it or not, again, I think they have, they're forcing tuition to rise. They're forcing families um, to leave private schools and go into the public sector. They're forcing our schools to close. They're disrupting, in the process, the lives of thousands of children. They're increasing the cost to taxpayers. They're taking families who are in uh, uh, the independent religious school system, which they're paying virtually nothing for, and they're spending now $14,000, $15,000, $18,000, $20,000 on those kids. Um, so taxpayers ought to be alarmed. Are we on time? I'm done. <laughs> I have a few more things to say. I see, I see, Tim, I see. Um, we'll let you sum up. <laughs> let me summarize with this. The question is why? Why do we have an unlevel playing field? Um, I'm going to add a little bit to Abe, the history that you mentioned in the creation of charter schools. When George Pataki was running for governor and was elected as governor, um, his transition committee was focused on the education transition committee was focused on vouchers and tax credits but when he got into office he realized okay that's not going to fly uh, so lawmakers enacted charter schools there's a lot more to the story than that but it wasn't because lawmakers didn't see catholic schools and religion independent schools as an alternative right and as, as uh, Saul said, as those jewels that they are, or as the, at the White House uh, uh, award ceremony two weeks ago was referred to as the lifeline for many uh, families. Some lawmakers have told me, uh, Democrats, Republicans alike, that Catholic schools um, are the oasis in certain neighborhoods. So they know what they're losing. The question is why? That's because we have um, an interest group who will have drawn the line in the sand and will do everything in their power, and they have a lot of power, to stop lawmakers from subsidizing the private school sector. And until we come to grips with that reality, I'm afraid uh, the alarm will continue to sound. Thank you. And finally, Joe Williams. Executive Director of Democrats for Education Reform, uh, according to the website, uh, among many initiatives, he and the Democrats for Education Reform support policies which stimulate the creation of new accountable public schools and which simultaneously close down failing schools. He supports mechanisms that allow parents to select excellent schools for their children and where education dollars follow each child to their school and they support clearly articulated national standards and expectations for core subject areas while allowing states and local districts to determine how best to make sure that all students are reaching those standards. Please welcome Mr. Williams. Thank you, this is thoroughly depressing. Uh, <laughs> like, like, uh, like Saul, I, uh, the lens that I look at this uh, 
through. It has to do with that new ecosystem which has kind of emerged. So that's the optimistic side of what I'm going to say before I get into all the pessimistic stuff, which is staring at us in the face. And I, I really appreciate the way you, you crunch the numbers on this. Um, I, I also, I'm a, uh, like, like James, I, I'm a parental choice person. I, I did, uh, as a journalist, worked in Milwaukee through the 90s when um, it was sort of the school choice capital of the world. So I did a lot of work there uh, in later years. And it, um, I really, I really began to appreciate the power of allowing parents to choose schools for their kids. So my perspective coming into this, and I should say my caveat, is I'm a public school parent. My kids attend New York City public schools. I do a lot of legislative work for charter schools. But I, I believe that for that ecosystem to be as strong as we need it to be, uh, we can't afford to have uh, great Catholic schools or great charter schools or great district schools. We have to have great Catholic schools and great charter schools and great public schools. So I, I really have this like utopian view of how this ought to be able to work. If we want parents to be able to choose, we've got to give them schools worth choosing. And my experience in Milwaukee, which had the, one, you know, the oldest parental choice uh, program in the country, is that we enabled parents to choose, but we didn't do more to give them great choices. Um, we had um, a, a private school sector which was um, had struggled for years. It was one of the one of the reasons we were able to build political support um, to enable private school choice in Milwaukee. But we enabled parents to choose from schools that had been weakened over the course of, of many years uh, and just weren't really up to, the, up to the task. We had them competing with public schools, which couldn't find their way out of a paper bag. We, uh, we, we didn't do anything to enable public schools to sort of manage their schools in a way that, that was anything rational, anything that any of us would consider rational. Um, and and we, were, we created vouchers, essentially, that were worth so little in terms of dollars that we didn't really do all the private schools much of a favor by giving them vouchers that didn't really cover the cost of educating the kids that, that they were educating. So we still were left with this financial crunch. Nowhere near as, as bleak as what you're presenting with these numbers. I mean, these are, these are massive numbers. Um, I have to say, I find it refreshing to hear about the, the impact of what charter schools could do in terms of students the way you've done it, because usually when we're dealing with opponents, tr traditional opponents of charter schools in the legislature, all they're talking about is the dollars. And I think if that you're starting with students is, is where the, this discussion has to be. Um, I, I think that in addition to uh, trying to figure out whatever kind of legislative remedies are required to, uh, to sort of stop the bleeding and, and try to create that kind of strong ecosystem that we need there, um, there, there really, as, as James uh, mentioned, there, there really needs to be a sort of doubling down on um, uh, th this idea of figuring out what, what should Catholic schools look like in, in the future and in the new world order. And I think it's, it's going to be time for everybody to step up their game if, if this ecosystem is going to work. If the charter schools are going to have to get better at what they're doing. The Catholic schools are going to have to get better at what they're doing. And the public schools are going to have to get better than what we're doing. We're in a totally new world right now. Um, it, it, this is no longer a world where you could you know, give somebody a high school diploma and expect them to go out and live a meaningful life. It, this is, you know, it's cliche to say, but we're, we're in this international competitive and internationally competitive environment right now. We're in an era of accountability in schooling um, where, where parents are actually increasingly savvy about um, the options that they have in front of them. And it, it's, um, it's going to be very difficult for any school in any of those three sort of sectors to get by just by saying, I'm a public school, or I'm a charter school, or I'm a Catholic school. It's going to have to be that particular school making a case to the particular parents that they're trying to attract about why their school is safe and, and going to be providing their children with the kind of education that they deserve. Charter schools have been very aggressive about doing this. The, the, as Saul mentioned, the impact that it's had on philanthropic giving um, is, is tied with that. You have. Um, a, a lot of uh, charter schools going around the country with charts and graphs showing, uh, you know, if, if you put a hundred thousand dollar investment in our school, here's here's the in, you know here's the outcomes that you're going to expect to see from it. Um, and I know that there's been a, a tremendous effort on trying to do that in the Catholic schools, but for whatever reason, um, we're not we're not getting that message. We're not hammering it home, and it's and it's, and it's not winning. Um, uh, Historically, I think the, the, um, the billing for this is about the tension between um, charter schools and Catholic schools. And I think at the school level, it, it has been um, a little bit more productive than it may sound uh, 
particularly just looking at the numbers. I uh, saw it mentioned up in, in Harlem, the, um, uh, you really get the sense of this parental choice sort of zone, actually they call it a parental choice zone up in Harlem, um, where they have, uh, or they used to have anyway, these big school choice fairs where, um, and it was actually the charter schools put it on, but they invited all of the Catholic schools, public schools, charter schools to come in up to the, up in the armory up in Harlem, and they all, you know, put out their booths and, and market themselves to parents. It's kind of phenomenal to actually to watch thousands of parents come in and kind of kick the tires on the schools that they're thinking about sending their children to. So for those of us who are school choice enthusiasts, it's it's kind of, it's, it's magical to see in, in practice. I think James talking about uh, whether or not we've got a level playing field, that's the key issue. Whether um, it's, it's not enough to be able to have schools with you know, booths next to one another in an auditorium trying to sell the parents. It's, 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 these, these schools have got to be able to compete um, in, a, in a fair way and really make a case that, uh, uh, that they're doing the best job that they can um, for kids. Uh, in, the, in the example of the Harlem schools as well, I know that the um, uh, charter schools up there have been working with um, uh, Catholic schools in particular. Um, uh, uh, Eva Moskowitz at the Success Charter Network, which Saul mentioned, um, made a case to the New York City Department of Education that they shouldn't have um, sole ownership of the, the list of potential kindergartners in New York City. That that ought to be available to everybody. And somehow she, uh, she just sort of sunk her teeth into Joel Klein's leg until he released the list. And, and she ended up sharing it with the Catholic schools up there. So uh, my understanding is that the charter school paid for the mailings that went out to advertise the Catholic schools uh, to families in, in the Harlem area. So I think that there's more, um, there's more co co cooperative work being done on the ground um, by people who embrace this idea of a school choice environment um, than, it, than it might uh, appear from some of the, the abstract discussions here. Um, it, it obviously doesn't change the significance of the numbers that we saw up here. I, I, um, I just in closing, would just say, I, 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 like I said, I do a lot of work with charter schools um, I do a lot of work uh, with public schools. I have a profound appreciation for the role that Catholic schools have played in New York City and elsewhere. I, I went to uh, Marquette University, so I was taught by Jesuits who, uh, who brainwashed us into thinking that Catholic education was a crucial part of uh, American civic life. Um, and we make our free throws in basketball. That was the other flip side of uh, what the, my, our Jesuits taught us there. But it, it's, um, I, I, it would be tragic if we could not figure out a way um, to, to prop up the Catholic school uh, sector so that it's part of the ecosystem that we need it to be. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll have a question and answer period now. Well, thank you. Could, uh, Abe, if you could ask, uh, if I could ask this question of you. Your statistics showed the migration of, of students leaving Catholic schools to both public and to the charters. You alluded that the motivation was primarily financial. Did your research look into other reasons why you saw that trend? Uh, let me talk about the level playing field, financial, and other reasons. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my higher ed experience. Um, there have been some internal polls done in the past of why. I'm talking now at the college level. Why do parents and students choose public schools over private colleges, public colleges over private colleges? And the top two reasons for why they choose public schools is actually not a surprise. Location nearby and cost. And then when they made the same question and polled families that sent their schools to private not-for-profit colleges, um, two reasons, and the first one wasn't a surprise. The second one was to me. The first reason was quality, the perception of quality. And the second reason, which was a very close second, was the sense of very loosely defined moral values. That, you know, there are some families who will make decisions based on cost and location. Others will make a decision based on quality and what I would say is moral values moral values. That was a very clear-cut decision when you go to K through 12 between the publics and let's say the private Catholic. And I think what's blurred that 
has been now that you have many charter schools who, while they are not religious, have this ethos of moral values. So you've now given a really clear, clear choice to families who didn't want to send their kids to publics because of the sense of a lack of moral values, but they see the charter schools as doing that. I still, as an economist, think price is critical. And I, I have one statistic which I didn't use. We have a level playing field in the higher ed world. In the higher ed world, we give, whether you go to a public university or a public, a, pri a public university or a Catholic university, we will basically give that student, depending on how you count, a $14,000 voucher between CAP, Pell, and subsidized student loans. So it, it doesn't matter whether you're going to a Catholic college or a public college. If you look at the period 1980 to 2009, enrollment in public schools, public universities in that period went up 57%. Enrollment in Catholic colleges went up 74%. If you give a level playing field, in my opinion, you allow people to make a decision based on what's best for that. When we get into K through 12, unlike college, we have really tilted that level playing field toward totally the publics. And now with charters, we have segmented even that public by I think offering K through 12 schools or K through six schools that get at the moral value issue. I don't know if that answers your question. The question of Catholic schools converting into charter schools, there's an enormous amount of discussion about that, uh, about that option. And uh, a number of, uh, of the, the few philanthropists, who, a small number, who are still giving a lot of money to Catholic schools, uh, Russ Koss, for example, has actually come out and said, look, this is a losing proposition. The numbers just don't match up. I don't mean the numbers that, you know, people leaving but just the account books. A certain amount of money uh, comes in for scholarship aid. And you can you know, uh, get a some amount of money from poor parents to pay some tuition because they really want their kids to be in the school. Uh, but you can't get water from a rock. I mean, and it's, so he said, what, what's left? And he has proposed it. And there have been active, uh, actually I think a few uh, Brooklyn Catholic schools are, are in the process of making that application. But, you know, I, am, I come at this from an outside, as an outsider, outside the uh, church walls. It's not my church, and that's, that's a very important discussion you have to have. And the question is, obviously, as an observer, is, yes, you, you gain a lot. You, know, you gain a lot of coinage, you know, a lot of dollars for doing that. Well, what do you lose? How much of that spiritual content is directly related to the faith, to the religion. I, I've been in Catholic schools where, I mean, I see it, I see the connection. They're, they're good, they, they beat the odds because of that, that, that faith. Would it, would, it, would it stay like that if you converted to a charter school and you said, okay, kids, you know, parents, after school, here's a religion class for you. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. You guys will have to. James? The, the Catholic school leadership, um, to a large degree, has already answered that. So and I think the answer is no. You, you, would you would lose that. You wouldn't have Catholic school anymore. Right? You'd have more schools operating under the, under the government school system. They would be Catholic-like in some respects, but they would not be Catholic schools that are infused with, with faith that, that make them the success that they are. Um, but put the question to, to tax, from a taxpayer's point of view. You could level the playing field for less than half of what it would uh, take um, with the solution of converting to charter schools, right? Why would taxpayers want to spend $14,000 on those children in a quasi-religious charter school when they could just give them a four, five, six thousand dollar scholarship, voucher, tax credit, reimbursement, whatever you want to call it, do it for less than half and keep those kids in the schools that the parents want them in. 
Um, it doesn't make sense fiscally to do that, and from an educational point of view, from a faith-based point of view, it doesn't make sense to convert to charter schools. Well, Although, it's out of desperation that people are considering just that. And when they do, in this city, in this state, and across the country, it's out of desperation. Uh, hi, uh, this is a, a data question. Maybe I, I'm not sure if I got it right, but let me run through the, the reasoning, because um, it's to uh, Mr. Lackman. Sure. Uh, you said there's 180 charter schools. Let's just, for argument's sake, say there's 500. That'd be 90,000 students. Um, did I, did you say, you said something like 37 or 38 percent of the students that had been in Catholic schools or no longer there went to charter schools? I think it was about 108, 110,000 that we see in this diminution. No, 87,000 on the K through 8. Okay. There's been a decline in K through 8 of 87,000. And I'm saying approximately 30,000 of them, under my analysis, went to charter schools. Okay, so 30,000 out of, let's say, 80,000, it's still a very large... 90,000, let's say, round it. So, yeah. so that's a very large number. Yeah. The, this is a data question, it's not a political question. Right. Doesn't that create a lot of self-selection, kind of metrics, sort of statistical principle issues when you start to compare uh, charter schools with, um, with, with district schools as typically see, I mean, there's a lot of self-selection going on. I was, so, so that's what I'm asking. That's kind right, of and that's why I came up, the way I was able to deal with that question, and it, was, and it was the critical assumption, was to look at what was going on in the 9 through 12, the high schools, where there are almost no charter schools, at least when the charter school movement started. And there you saw a drop in enrollment of about 11%. There was some other noise in the system. But I said if the K through eight, if the K through eight cohort declined by the same, roughly the same percentage as what happened in the high school cohort, that's where I get like 35,000 in effect went not to the charter schools, but went to other public schools. And then I have that residual of 30,000 which I attribute to charter schools. But this is a data question. So when, when, when somebody like the New York Post writes an editorial and they compare how it's a charter school doing to a district school, it seems to me one third of your charter school students are the same kind of people that would have sent their parents, their children to Catholic school. Just it's a matter of sort of econometric principles. That's not a very good apples to apples comparison. Well, but let me give some, no, That's you know, it's, it's a question of you looking at the, the data in the macro and then you're looking at the data micro. I'll take city of Albany. City, and this is more anecdotal, but the numbers are there as well. In the last decade, the city of Albany, where the charter school movement is probably the most robust in the whole state in terms of percentage of the school district, the charter school movement seems to have added 4,000 students. And when you talk to people in the city of Albany, 2,000 of them came out of the public school system into the charter school system, and about 2,000 of them came out of the Catholic school system into the charter school system. So there, in, in a city where I spent a little bit more time looking at it, again, it's, it reflects the statewide data, which is that roughly half of the students going into the charter school system are coming out of the publics, but with a much bigger base and about half of them are coming out of the Catholic school system. This is all macro data. But my point is, is when people, I didn't realize, when people, it's a common sort of trope of, in the, in the debate, right. are charter schools working? And people always say, well, it's not self-selection. They look at socioeconomic data. But all I'm saying, that's a, that's a powerful uh, variable, and I wasn't aware of the size of it. Yeah, I, I was very careful, not in my analysis, talk about whether charter schools are working, whether they're doing a better education. In my analysis, I was looking at fundamentally where they were coming from. Oh, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, but from going forward, now when I look at these, these uh, comparisons, I'm going to say to myself, you've, you're, not, you're not dealing with apples to apples uh, comparisons, and I just was not aware of the size of the cohort that is now in these charter schools, that you're telling me is basically one third would formerly have been in Catholic schools. And if right. you make the assumption- Or, those or are, would have gone to a Catholic school. Right, are different kinds of people. Yeah. That just tells me that the people that look at this from a data point of view in terms of deciding how good are charter schools or how good are not charter schools, right. 
are dealing with some very, very shaky data. I think that's extremely important, and I was not aware of it. That's what so, I was, some I, of those comparisons, though, um, look at uh, the lottery at the charter school. So the, the, the self-selection is the same. So you're getting parents who might have chosen Catholic schools who enroll in a charter compared with parents who might have chosen Catholic schools who go into a district school because they don't get into the school in the lottery. It's not usually just a, a comparison between the charter and the, and the district. That's and, and I think the other key factor, which James talked about, all of a sudden around the state, you just have to pick up the paper, Catholic schools are closing left and right. And as soon as they close, those students have a choice. They can go to a Catholic school significantly further away from their home, or they can try to transfer into a public school or a, or a charter school. And I see a lot of that going on, and that number is reflected in the data. I'm making a, not making a political point. I'm yes. just saying, even if you go into a lottery, you're a different person. Yes. I'm just saying right. Right. a good econometrician, seeing the size of that cohort, says, whoa, stop. We need to get better apples to apples comparisons to make. And I was, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize. I think that really tells them. I, I, I think the next step in my analysis is to do the econometric analysis. I think what's, I'll say, unique about um, this analysis, to the best of my knowledge, at least in New York, is the first analysis looking at the data and trying to attribute where they're coming from before you get to the econometric analysis. And charter schools are public schools. On, on, on your point about teacher pay and uh, coaching, well, you know, uh, I, I don't think coaching is a solution for, for bad teachers, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I could have all the coaching in the world, but I still can't make a three-point shot. Uh, and I think there are some teachers. Well, but that, that, that means that, that co the, the ball coaching ball. is just more, uh, uh, an orphan is more of the same. There's no, but, there's but no the magic formula. That, that means that and but, by the way, bonuses, the evidence is overwhelming that bonuses don't work. They tried bonuses, the DOE tried bonuses, it ran its own study. It's a little complicated how the bonuses were done. But it ran its own studies uh, on the bonuses and conceded that there was no improvement uh, in the schools where bonuses were given out either to teachers or to principals. It's a pretty complicated question. If, if you ask the question, you know, why should the government support private schools? Why should the government support any private decision of citizens? But if you're going to ask that question, then you have to ask it of health care and higher education and daycare because the government subsidizes, has a level playing field, provides a level playing field in virtually every sector of our society except K through 12. Most developed nations provide a level playing field in education, including K through 12, except here in the United States. So you have to ask the question, why, why not? Uh, I want to build on a comment that Joe made, and that we need a robust system that supports families, regardless of what their choices are, whether it's homeschool, regular public school, charter school, independent religious school, the role of government is to educate the public, right? And let the public choose, because the public, the parents are the ones who bring children into the world. They should be the ones who direct that child's education. The government has an obligation to support those families, not, not direct it as a government um, operation exclusively. And it will be less expensive by the government subsidizing the private sector. One of the reasons it is so expensive is because we don't have the subsidy in the private sector and it's costing so much more to educate those kids only in the government sector. We've actually had um, a number of pieces of legislation for the last um, 15, 20 years uh, in Albany, but they haven't moved. Why? Well, um, we have an interest group uh, that pretty much uh, dictates what uh, education policy is going to be in this state. Um, however, um, A. Blackman's numbers are alarming, and I think that's going to bring to light the lawmakers a, 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 an element to the discussion that hasn't been here before. If you take the, the remaining charter schools that have yet to be authorized, uh, we have another 260 schools to authorize. If you um, fill half of those schools with private school kids, it's going to cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars more than they had anticipated. Um, that's a new element to the discussion, which I think will change things. Last year, also, a, a tax credit, education tax credit bill was passed by the state Senate um, with strong bipartisan support. 
um, and we're hoping to build on that uh, and get more and more support in the assembly and, and with Governor Cuomo. Um, that's, a, that's a piece of legislation that provides tax credits to corporations and individuals who make donations to public schools, private schools, charter schools. So it, it provides, it's a solution that provides a level playing field. And I think it's that reason that that bill got such strong bipartisan support. Joe, do you want to say anything in here? I, I, I agree that this argument is very different than, than the political arguments that have been made in the past. I think this is, it's, it's, it's has the potential to feel like a whole new ball game on, on this, in this regard. And I, and I think, um, you know, th th using phrases like you know leveling the playing field, there's a, there's ways to get public school activists working together with charter school activists and private school activists together to, to push something like that. In Washington D.C., uh, where they have a, a, a voucher program, um, they they would fight. They call it a tri-sector approach. So when they would lobby, they would lobby for funding for the, the religious schools, the charter schools, and the district schools together. And it's uh, it's it's actually quite powerful when you when you align those interests together with a common argument like that. Uh, I I want to make one point just to be a uh, a bit of a dissenter on this harmony up here, and that is that uh, although there is a very strong moral argument you know, that you've heard tonight for uh, leveling the playing field, treating religious schools equally, providing uh, vouchers. Uh, the theory, uh, basically, the theory of, of, of efficacy of uh, vouchers uh, is that the competition will raise all ships. Um, I, I have to say, and I've written about this and got a lot of hell for it, uh, the reality is that it hasn't been proven at all. There isn't one city in this country which has had vouchers that has shown uh, really... It, it, it's raised graduation rates in the... Uh, in the Schools, Catholic schools particularly, where kids get vouchers. Parents are happier because they're safe. They know their kids will come home at 3 o'clock, for sure. Uh, but if you look at Milwaukee, it's really tragic that after 20 years of a voucher, of the biggest voucher program in the country, the scores in the new, in Milwaukee public schools and, uh, and Catholic and the scores of the voucher students are not much better, are dismal. Dismal. They're at the level of Detroit. In the last NAEP, that's National Assessment of Education Progress, black students in Milwaukee scored, 7% of the black students in Milwaukee scored at proficiency in reading. 7%. So, again, I, 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 I morally agree with parental choice, but we have to see better evidence. Uh, and we, in my view, we have to focus, a subject we haven't discussed at all, is let's look at what's happening in the classroom. We haven't mentioned the, the graduate schools of education that train the te our teachers and do a horrendous job. Teach them everything that's wrong about what should be done in the classroom. So uh, that's, uh, that's an important caveat. I Can think I just, I ten, ten seconds on that though. I, I think that that's my point though is that Saul's talking about sort of the old argument that competition was going to lift all the boats. This is a different argument here. This is that a sector that has served this city for a long time is about to collapse, which I think, I just think that's going to get a different reception from. Oh, I agree. A, that's a good suggestion. Um, in putting this data together, besides looking at the enrollment for New York City in terms of Catholic, charter, and public, we have and Katie is here, we have collected the data for the um, Cleveland and Milwaukee to see, to compare them to New York, to see if the um, subsidy has made a difference in their trend. I haven't completed that analysis, but you're suggesting that I do comparable analysis in New York for the other private, which I think is a good idea. I will say it's somewhat dangerous, as you know, to look at one or two schools. My number is statewide macro, which I try to break down into K through six, K through eight, and nine through 12. But since Katie is here and we're hearing you um, to extend our study, it's, not, it's a very good suggestion. And Joe actually gave me another suggestion earlier, which I think would be very helpful, is to look at these trends in states that don't do charters at all. Washington and, State. Washington State. So 
it's next step. And the last step is to thank you all for coming, uh, in particular our panel.